purpose for this video titled Best Practice Resistance Training Program Design Template is to give a 30,000 foot bird's eye view of how to design resistance training programs for everyone who is starting out on a program. There are so many people who fall into the category of what's called traditional medical fitness special population, meaning they've been diagnosed with chronic disease and or musculoskeletal conditions. In fact, upwards of 70% of the U.S. population falls into that category. Many of them are hesitant to strength train because of fear of hurting themselves or experiencing a flare-up. They are hesitant to work with a trainer for fear of the same thing. And many clinicians are hesitant to refer these patients to trainers because they see what's going on in the industry with the lack of standardization, and they don't want their patients to be placed into the hands of trainers who lack the skill set to train people who need special considerations inserted into their program. The very people who need to strength train the most are being referred the least and engaging in strength training the least. In this video, I'll explain a common sense template that literally applies to everyone, which is clinically safe and merges the concepts and guidelines of exercise science, strength and conditioning, medicine, and sports medicine. It is a best practice resistance training protocol. And for those who are being referred through the medicine to fitness or medicine to rehab to fitness pathway, this is a perfect continuation of the continuity of patient care. Please understand this is a bird's eye view and that you'll need to read my book, The Medical Fitness Bible, and watch the instructional videos on each component to understand in more detail how everything merges, as this is intended to be an entire educational course. The first thing to understand is that the design of resistance training programs should be broken down into two categories. The first is the initial program design which is also known as the familiarization or adaptation phase. This is the learning curve phase where the person still has their training wheels on. This phase also very closely mimics what occurs in physical therapy, which I'll explain in more detail in a future slide. But generally, what I mean is that you start at about 10 repetitions per set and about two sets for each exercise. And during this phase, you begin with low rate of perceived effort which means the intensity of each set is in the warm-up range, and you're either teaching or learning proper form, determining the appropriate exercises, determining pain-free available range of motion, and using cues such as verbal, visual, and tactile cues to develop mind-muscle connections. This learning curve phase can last anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months, but at some point, the training wheels need to come off and it's time to leave the initial program design and begin ongoing, long-term progression. The way you do this is by engaging, at least at the start, in a linear periodized program. The reason why I say at least at the start is because you can switch over to a non-linear periodized program at some point, which I'll describe in another video. But it makes complete sense to begin in a linear fashion. And the way you do that is by moving from the initial 10 repetitions per set into the 12 to 15 repetition range, which is considered the light loading domain, stay there for a phase, which I'll also explain in an upcoming slide, and then drop to the 10 to 12 repetition range and the 8 to 10 repetition range, which are considered moderate loading domains, and then drop to the 6 to 8 repetition range which is considered the upper end of the heavy loading domain. This is a common sense way to follow the ACSM and NSCA guidelines to train across the six to 15 repetition spectrum, which is the suggested continuum to develop general strength fitness. It's also common sense because it makes perfect sense to begin at the top end of that continuum, starting with light loads, and then move through in a linear fashion down to the bottom end of the continuum. So what I just described in this big circle is the overall framework and a very basic overview of strength and conditioning and exercise science resistance training principles. It also describes a level of clinical safety because you're starting with that light to moderate intensity, physical therapy-like learning curve phase, the familiarization and adaptation phase, 
which significantly reduces or negates any risk of injury or exacerbation. And again, if the person has been referred from a physician or physical therapist, this initial phase is a perfect start point to continue their care. If the person who's been referred does have disease or joint pain, it's a perfect start point because it will lower any apprehensions they have. And even if the person doesn't have disease or joint pain, it's still a perfect start point because if they're new to strength training, there's still going to be a learning curve. And the learning curve will still include most of the same conservative attributes. They'll just be able to move through this phase more quickly. Now I'll describe how to merge medical and sports medicine guidelines to create even more clinical safety. The first are two closely related concepts called auto-regulation and readiness to train. Readiness to train just refers to a list of questions that should always be asked prior to the start of a session to ensure the individual is both mentally and physically ready to engage in a session and to help determine what the volume and intensity of the session should be. More on that in a bit. Auto-regulation refers to making adjustments, if needed, during the session based on how the person is feeling and responding to the session. These two concepts can be summed up with the phrase, measure their readiness and training response to every session and adjust accordingly, which creates a significant level of safety. The next concept is what I call the mantra and describe in more detail in other videos. This is a way to insert safety from a musculoskeletal standpoint, where you make sure the design of the program includes balancing flexibility around each major joint, balancing strength around each major joint, and ensuring proper form with every exercise. Next is another musculoskeletal concept called the insertion of joint-friendly exercises. At the knee, hip, spine, shoulder, and neck, there are standard exercises and guidelines which are considered joint friendly and are very commonly used in traditional physical therapy. Knowing these exercises and guidelines and inserting them into the overall framework adds another layer of musculoskeletal safety. And the last concept to merge into the framework is from a medical standpoint, knowing the special considerations for any chronic disease that the person may have. I'll give some examples in a bit. These five circles describe the template that can be used in every situation for general and special populations and is a perfect way to merge exercise science, medicine, and sports medicine guidelines to create safety within each session, within each phase, and for the long term. This slide just gives a little more detail about the initial familiarization phase. You begin at about 10 reps per set and then use this phase to determine available pain-free range of motion, determine the appropriate exercises, teach names of exercises in proper form, use a rate of perceived effort scales to determine both initial loads and safe rate of progression, and use verbal, visual, and tactile cueing to help develop mind-muscle connections. How do you know when it's time to take the training wheels off? when the movement for each exercise starts to become natural so that there is either no need for cueing or that the cueing is minimal. And when the intensity of each set reaches the low end of what's considered a true working set, which is equivalent to a seven on a one to 10 RPE scale. It also means that at the end of the set, the lifter is showing a sincere look of strain on their face, which is called face of effort and where there's a noticeable decrease in the speed of movement of the last repetition of the set. Once the training wheels are off, it's time to progress for the long term. This is where you stop limiting set volume to two to three sets of 10 and begin training across a much wider spectrum of repetition ranges as the ACSM and NSCA suggest. As the chart shows, each phase length should last three to four weeks. And while it's not the only goal, primary goal in each phase is to make sure strength increases with each exercise so that at the end of the phase, the lifter is a little stronger than they were when they started. It's called progressive overload and should be a natural occurrence because the body will adapt and get stronger as long as sets are being taken to within one to three reps of muscle failure. If the effort is there, the adaptations will be there too. As I alluded to previously, 
This approach is also a logical way to begin training with light loads, which will improve overall work capacity and general conditioning. Move through the two moderate loading domains, which will continue to increase work capacity and conditioning. Begin to increase strength and have a positive effect on lean muscle tissue. And then finish in the upper end of the heavy loading domain, which is where strength development is being optimized. The reason there's no need to fear that six to eight rep range in most situations, no matter what the person's condition is or how old they are, is because several months have passed by the time they get to this rep range, their fitness has improved, and if you really think about it, you're only lowering the reps by two as compared with the eight to 10 rep range, which means the loads are only increased a little bit. You can also use the first week as a familiarization week, and barely increase the loads at all. Auto-regulating the sessions and including the special considerations for disease and joint-friendly exercises are other reasons why we shouldn't fear training in this rep range. We're specifically and purposefully setting up multiple layers of safety. Avoiding this rep range is what people should be afraid of because it allows them to remain vulnerable for injury, re-injury, or some sort of exacerbation. It's in these lower repetition ranges that the optimization is really beginning to happen. In any case, other important things to consider within the overall context of a periodized program, especially as compared with the initial familiarization phase, are to have some sessions where working sets are being taken a little closer to muscle failure, such as an 8 on a 1 to 10 RPE scale. Begin to vary session intensities so that some sessions are a little harder and some are purposely light to moderate. Increase variety of exercise selection increase how many sets are performed per large muscle group within the scope of a session and within the scope of each week with the goal of performing at least 10 sets per legs, back, chest, and shoulders per week and preferably in the 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 sets per week range. Doing all of this will increase overall conditioning, strength, lean muscle tissue, and improve joint stability. Now I'll provide a little more insight to each of the four smaller circles in the overall template. But understand, this video is not meant to give a comprehensive overview. The information is covered in much more detail with the book and in related instructional videos. Readiness to train just means to begin every session without fail by asking this list of questions to make sure the person is fueled up, hydrated, has taken their medications and feels both mentally and physically ready to train. And to use these questions to auto-regulate the session if they aren't feeling quite up to par that day. And if necessary, based on how the lifter is responding to the session and based on how they're feeling both mentally and physically, you can adjust accordingly by increasing or decreasing set volume which means how many sets are performed per exercise, per muscle group, or within the session as a whole. Increasing or decreasing the intensity of sets, and therefore overall session intensity, meaning taking sets either closer to muscle failure or terminating sets further from muscle failure. Altering the selection of exercises to make them more or less challenging, such as deciding to perform a leg press instead of a squat or deadlift, or on the other side of the coin, a squat or deadlift instead of a less challenging and less taxing leg press. And increasing rest periods between sets to reduce overall intensity or decreasing rest periods between sets to increase overall intensity. And then we wanna make sure another primary goal of the overall exercise prescription includes balancing flexibility around each major joint, balancing strength around each major joint, and ensuring proper form. This, along with overall strength development, is what I call my mantra because it's the corrective exercise philosophy for nearly every musculoskeletal issue, no matter what it is or where it's located. I go over this in a lot more detail in the book and related videos. By joint-friendly exercises, I just mean common rehab-friendly exercises that are safe for the knee, hips, spine, shoulder, and neck. 
With the knee, I mean exercises like bridges or hip thrusts. Leg press. Knee curls and short arc knee extensions. And calf raise. Examples of joint friendly exercises at the spine include modified or traditional planks and side planks. And various Pilates mat exercises. Finally, at the shoulder, examples include rows, reverse flies, face pulls, and rotator cuff strengthening exercises. And two quick examples of how to insert special considerations for disease would be making sure the training environment is cool, longer rest periods between sets, adequate hydration, and taking mobility issues into consideration for individuals diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, or checking blood sugar to make sure it's in the safe range, ensuring that some carbs are on hand, and being aware of the signs of hypoglycemia for individuals diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. These medical special considerations also include any side effects medications might have or the need to properly time the ingestion of medications with an exercise session. In conclusion, hopefully you're able to see that while we can take each of these concepts and begin peeling away the onion to get deeper into exactly how to implement each one, the overall philosophy on how to design a principle-based, clinically safe, best practice resistance training program is pretty straightforward and common sense. Please make sure to read my book, The Medical Fitness Bible, and watch the corresponding videos to learn exactly how to design programs the right way. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next instructional video.